live from Liverpool, the Dark Paranormal, season 14. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Dark Paranormal and it's season finale time for season 14. Last week we of course heard the stories from Jackie about her house that she moved into following a messy divorce. And despite leaving the house due to all of the paranormal activity that she encountered, despite her better judgement, she allowed her younger sister, Emma, to move in. The reason being, Emma had clashed with her parents and also was highly sceptical of each and every paranormal event that Jackie would tell her. And it was only after the two of them experienced true paranormal phenomena within the house did Jackie put pressure on Emma to write down her experience so they could send them both in together. Now, in truth, I received Jackie's email way before Emma's, but I received constant reminders from Jackie that don't worry, Emma's email will arrive. And indeed it did. And therefore I decided both emails would be read as the penultimate and the season finale. Therefore, although both of these episodes can be standalone episodes... I would strongly recommend going back to listen to episode 9, Jackie's Story, or part 1 of The Unwelcoming. Now, before we get into Emma's experience, a few quick announcements. Firstly, of course, with it being our season finale, we're due to take our standard three-week break, which means our next debut episode for season 15 will take place on the 29th of March. And yes, that is Good Friday. So let's hope it's a very good Friday, if that's not too sacrilegious. Although, given some of the experiences we've covered on the show, I think we may have crossed that boundary a long time ago. But that is the date for your calendars. Friday the 29th of March is when The Dark Paranormal returns for season 15. As I've said before, we already have all the slots filled. Yet, as with each season, I keep a few of those episodes as kind of floater episodes. Meaning, I don't want you to stop sending in your true paranormal experiences to contact at thedarkparanormal.com because if the right episode comes in, it will find its way into season 15. Now I know I'm guilty of it myself, that most podcasters would say it's our best upcoming season yet. I'm not going to say that. What I am going to say is there are going to be a few twists and turns, a few shock returns from people who have had some of the best experiences we've ever covered. There is one episode in particular that literally on a weekly basis I'm emailed to ask which episode is this and they will describe what goes on. And it's always the same episode. Well, the individual involved in that experience has an updated experience equally as terrifying coming up in season 15. And if it has the same impact that their original submission did, then, like I say, I won't go as far as to say this is the best season coming ever. But I will say it may be the most interesting. Now, of course, over the next few weeks, the lights go dark for everyone except our Patreons. By signing up to Patreon, not only will you be the first to hear every episode that's released on the main feed, including debuts and finales, but they will also all be ad-free. On top of that, you also get your own personal paranormal podcast, Dark Bites. Now that's for Patreons only and it releases every Sunday of the year without fail. Meaning during this downtime, they will still receive their weekly dose of the dark paranormal. But the best thing about Patreon, genuinely, is the community. We've built a very safe space of like-minded paranormal enthusiasts over on Patreon. 
and we'd love to extend an exclusive invitation just for you. Simply head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. Just like the following wonderful new team members have. Kristen Johnson, Ursa, Courtney Henderson, Courtney Petrucci, Desiree Carpenter, Des Larson, Maria Rathel, Michelle Burgess, Denise Monteith, Danny Austin, Stephanie Buzzell, Virginia Austin, Susie Locke, Drew Bedard, Laura Gunn, Laura, Coach E, a.k.a. Gavin's mum, loved you guys, Rini Wright, Brandon Bookout, Teddy Moatha, Sarah Marie, Hannah, Katie Harding, Christy Miller, John Corrin, Howard Grimshaw, Michelle Mazuka, Julia, Brianna D, Emerald, Jay White and Papa Sigma. Thank you so much guys, your support truly means the world to me. And if you like the sound of early ad-free releases for debuts and finales, and also access to the Patreon-only podcast Dark Bites and its entire back catalogue, head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. But right now, for the final time in season 14, lower those lights, make yourself comfortable, and of course... Leave your disbelief at the door, as we hear all about The Unwelcoming, Part 2. Dear Dark Paranormal Podcast Team, My sister Jackie is a big fan of your show. I must confess, I'm not. Sorry. Not that I objectively dislike it, I've never listened. The paranormal and all of that type of stuff, UFOs and whatnot, well, it doesn't really interest me. That said, I, right now, can't say I've not experienced the paranormal. Quite the opposite, in fact. This is what's led to this email. Or should I say, my sister Jackie is what's led to this email. She told me all about the things going on at the house while she lived there, and I, foolishly in hindsight, just didn't believe her. Like I said, the paranormal doesn't fit into my world view. But when Jack allowed me to move into her house, after a falling out with my parents, my world view became less and less relevant and more fragmented as the weeks went on. Yes, Jack had told me all about her supposed experiences, and the fact that sadly a former tenant had committed suicide by hanging in the attic. But one, I didn't believe her experiences. Two, all houses have a history. All houses if around long enough, will have bad things happen in them. And three, and most importantly, I'd be in my own place. And for the first time, have autonomy on when I came and when I left. What I ate. Who I brought home. I was basically adulting for the first time in my life. And it was long overdue. So, Jackie's fleeing due to an apparent spooky occurrence meant zero to my sceptical, desperate self. But by God, was I in for a reality check. And it was Jack who asked me to write down my experiences and my dealings with that house and send them in. Apologies if this has arrived much later than Jackie's, It's not something I care to write, but I do care for my sister. And at least in sending this, her opening line every time we meet won't be, Have you sent that email to the Dark Paranormal yet? I've even CC'd her in for proof. Hi, Jackie. So, I'll get on with it. My initial weeks in the house were peaceful, albeit a bit lonely. I surprisingly missed the constant bickering with my parents. Not enough to move back, mind you. But going from a bustling house to an empty one does make you feel like you're rattling around a bit. The initial spooky things 
realistically didn't even register as such. Yeah, the occasional odd noise. Maybe an out-of-place breeze. Yes, sometimes I'd have a fleeting sense of unease. But I put that down to Jackie's tales. To the fact I lived alone. The house's age and my imagination. But as the time passed, these occurrences became harder to ignore. For example, one night, whilst reading in bed, there was a sudden draught. I glanced at the window, expecting to see it slightly open, but the curtain was still as a mill pond. I went back to my book, but something atop of my vision caught my eye. I glanced up and saw a soft, greenish light hovering near my closet. It moved with an unnatural fluidity, pulsating, and then darting away and vanishing. I was frozen, my heart pounding in my chest. The logical part of my brain scrambled for an explanation. Maybe, maybe, maybe a laser pen from outside. I glared at the tightly shut curtains. I squeezed my eyes tightly and reopened them. Maybe it was me. Something amiss with my eyes. But no, everything was clear. Okay, I thought to myself. One nil to the unexplainable. I calmed myself down. I pushed that sighting to the WTF section of my brain and I went back to my book. But, rather disconcertingly for someone like me, these sightings of the floating lights became more frequent, appearing in different parts of the house, always just out of reach, always disappearing before I could even comprehend what I was seeing. Day, night... Right, I'll book an eye test, and I'll explain what I'm seeing. Floaters. That was the best offer the optician gave me. Floaters. Like I don't know the difference between dead skin on your eyeball and a moving, green, pulsating orb of light. Then... The sounds in the attic began. A persistent scratching sound that would start every night as soon as I turned off the lights. It didn't sound like the scurrying of rodents. It was louder, more deliberate. Like the desperate clawing of someone or something trying to escape. No, Emma. Stop falling down that hole and call rent a kill. I did. They came. They checked the attic. There were no droppings, no gnaw marks, not a single scratch mark. But they left behind some baited traps just in case. The house, as stupid as it sounds, began creaking and groaning more than usual. But still I dismissed it as the house settling. But then I'd find doors open that I'd definitely closed. And I mean I'd close a bedroom door, get to the top of the stairs, and I'd catch sight of it slowly opening. Dodgy hinges, maybe? A spot of WD-40 would sort that. But then I'd wake in the early hours to go down and get a glass of water. And all the living room lights and kitchen lights would be turned on. Then there were the cold spots in random places. It was the middle of summer. I had every window open. One of those days you're literally fighting to get cool. I was walking barefoot across the landing and I walked into a solid chunk of cold air. I mean, I was so took aback, I stood still in it, and I put my arms out either side. My arms were hot, sweaty, 
the warmth of the overall house. But my feet were turning into ice blocks. The tip of my nose ice cold. I could see my breath. But interestingly, only about a foot from where I was, and then it would dissipate back into the heat. I stepped out back into the warmth and back into the cold spot numerous times. I looked around for an obvious source, but nothing stood out. Well, if I can't explain it, I can at least document it. So I ran downstairs to get a digital thermometer, and I ran back upstairs two at a time. I stood back in the cold. Oh, it had gone. Everywhere was warm again. Okay, in the WTF bin you go. In brackets, I'm surprisingly good at this. Close brackets. Though I must confess, the one thing that both gave me a grasp at the rational and also a genuine pause of concern was that just to the left of the cold spot was the entrance to the attic. Now, my rational brain wanted that to be the cause of the cold spot. However, during heat waves, attics are the hottest place in the house. Believe me, that's where my bedroom was in my parents. And I always had three large fans running all the time in the summer. The knowledge of the suicide that happened up there began to creep around the edges of my thinking, and I didn't like that one bit. These happenings began to escalate physically. I'd be laying in bed and I'd hear a crash from the living room. I'd run downstairs, the light already on of course, and find nothing out of place. I'd survey the scene and turn to leave, and behind me I'd hear a noise. Now genuinely panicked, someone may be hiding... I had my phone in my hand, and I shouted out, I've dialed 999, and my thumb's on the call button. Silence. And then I noticed a picture of me and Jack had fallen to the floor. I picked it up, and I rehung it. I spun round. Something definitely whispered from the spot I'd just been standing in. Well, my WTF box was full. I could picture the box almost shrugging at me as if to say, this isn't normal, this is paranormal. This incident was the first time I remember feeling a fracture in my worldview. Shit. Almost sensing the crack in my proverbial window, so to speak, one night it decided to smash the bastard in. I was in bed. Daydreaming and in that hypnagogic state, half asleep, half awake, aware of my surroundings, but also seeing myself in a... Something gripped my right ankle from under the bed. I screamed and I fled that room. I spent the rest of the night in my car, rubbing my ankle. There were no marks, but it was a genuine grip. A slow grip, too. Like when fingers roll into a grip one by one to ensure a good purchase. I debated calling Jackie to explain and to ask if I could stay the night, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. So the car was my bedroom for that night, and I was too afraid to go back in my own home. Not that I slept. I just ran through everything in my head. Everything that had happened from day one. Trying to find some pattern. Some form of rationality. But there was none. Okay. Tack two. Let's go with Jack's story. My house is haunted by a guy who killed himself in the attic. So, let's assume... Given the scratching, the cold spots, etc., 
that that was where he resides. I specifically recall looking at the clock in my car, and it read 4.23. I remember this specifically, as I kind of stared through it, debating my next move. As it struck 4.24, that's when I decided the only solution was to confront whoever or whatever was in that attic. That very next afternoon, I cautiously climbed the creaky stairs to the attic, armed with nothing but a large torch and my phone. The atmosphere was stifling. The air thick, not just with heat, but an unspoken ugliness. That I've just walked in on an argument feeling. Without a clue what I was doing, I spoke aloud, asking the spirit to find peace and move on. Nothing happened. But I still felt the need to say thank you as I left. I turned to leave, and I felt an icy, one-handed grip come around my throat from behind, tightening. I recognised the grip immediately. It tried to lift me off my feet, but only managed getting me as far as my tiptoes before dropping me like a sack of potatoes. I crumpled. My elbow took the brunt, bleeding immediately. The wind was knocked out of me, and so, gasping for air, I scrambled out of the attic. The paranormal may not have fitted into my world view, but that day... It kicked itself into my existence. Now, at my wit's end, and desperate for a solution, I dialed the number of the one person I knew would listen without judgement. No, not Jackie, but my oldest friend, Marie. Marie was into all this, though she would be shocked to hear my cry for help about all this. That much I knew. After hearing me out and what felt like an age, Marie said, Emma, you've got to do something. This spirit or whatever it is, it sounds serious. Have you thought about bringing in a spirit medium? A medium? I almost scoffed. My scepticism was surfacing despite everything going to the contrary but the seed of hope Marie planted grew quickly in my desperation. All right, yeah, okay, I finally agreed, much to Marie's surprise. Do you know anyone? Um, yeah, yeah, I think I do, actually. I'll send you the contact of a lady I know. It was a co-worker I used to work with. Supposedly, she's the real deal. So, two days later... There I am, opening the front door to a small, unassuming mid-sixties woman. She introduced herself as Leela, the spirit medium. She literally used those words. She was calm, instantly likeable, and had very kind eyes. I invited her in, and we sat on the couch, so I went and made us both a cup of tea. After a brief explanation of the situation... Leela, the spirit medium, requested to see the attic, alone. I just need to feel the space, love, she said, her voice confident and very much I've got this in her tone. I watched her ascend the stairs, each step creaking underfoot like a film, until she disappeared into the recesses of the attic. While I went back downstairs... Pottering around, biting my nails, minutes seeming like an eternity. My imagination conjuring up all sorts of outcomes. Yet, when Leela returned, her expression was one of intrigue rather than fear. She very methodically sat down on the couch. There's a strong presence, she began. 
I mean, nothing happened whilst I was up there. However, I was drawn to that small metal cubbyhole. It seemed significant. I sipped my tea and shook my head. That thing? Now that's been jammed shut since we moved in. Leela's eyes widened. Really? Jammed shut? Well, it was open just now. Curiosity peaked. I led the way back to the attic. My heart started to pound in my chest. True to Leela's word, the rusted metal door of that cubbyhole was swung wide open, revealing its contents for the first time. Two wedding rings and what appeared to be a very old, very faded marriage certificate. Leela's gaze fixed on the items. Then she coughed, clearing her throat, straightened her back, and her expression shifted to one of deep concentration. There's a very angry man standing right next to us. She whispered, her voice barely audible. He's saying, I will never leave my home, my wife's home, and I'll see anyone off who thinks otherwise. I was frozen. I didn't want to look to my right, but I did, and I couldn't see anyone or anything. But the air in the attic seemed to thicken with tension. Leela's whispered words hanging heavy around us. Leela suggested that I left while she attempted to communicate further with the spirit. He's angry, but he's calm right now. But he keeps darting his eyes between the two of us. I think it's best if you're not here, so he knows who he's dealing with. I just nodded and quickly took myself down to the kitchen, busying myself with mindless tasks cleaning already clean plates, doing my utmost to quell the rising tide of anxiety. A deafening thump from two floors above made my heart leap into my throat. I stood at the bottom of the stairs, listening. I wanted to shout, Are you okay? But I also began thinking maybe she was in the middle of some ritual or other. And so, back to cleaning the already clean cutlery I went. An agonising ten minutes passed before Leela slowly and precariously made her way down the stairs. She was using the wall and the banister for support. Her complexion ghostly pale. Her breaths coming in ragged gasps. Clutching at her neck with one hand and reaching for the front door with the other. I ran out of the kitchen before she could flee. What happened? I asked. My only advice, she managed between laboured breaths. Leave while you can. She reached for the front door, and as she did so, she moved her hand, and I caught sight of deep, angry finger marks encircling her throat, standing out on her pale skin. Well, I opened the door for Leela, and she tottered off down the path. But now I was angry. No, sorry, who the hell does he think he is? I ran furiously up those stairs until I was stood once more in the attic. I now noticed the metal door was again closed over. The air felt charged. He was definitely still here. Good. I don't know why you're staying or why you're angry, but I'm angry now. Listen, shit happens in life. Man the fuck up, I shouted into the silence. But I think my bravery left with the force of my last line, and I felt a chill all over. I quickly changed tack. Listen, I said in a much calmer tone, this is my home now, and I'm not...
Something pushed me on both shoulders with such force my arms flailed to grab onto something before I'd end up head first down the stairs. Getting my balance, I ran, grabbing my coat without stopping and charging out of the front door. I left the house that day, my body trembling uncontrollably as I walked at pace to Jackie's. My mind in a state of shock. I just couldn't bring myself to step foot in that house again. We were done with each other. I temporarily moved in with Jackie, who, after I told her what I'd experienced, put the house up for sale. Within a month, the house had been purchased by developers. They planned to demolish it, and in its place now stands a pub slash hotel. A part of me felt relief, hoping that the destruction of this house had also demolished the haunting. But another part of me wonders, if such things exist, as I now know they do, can they ever truly be destroyed? Or do they simply move on to another place, another victim? I'm not sharing this for sensationalism, but as a warning, almost a plea for understanding, because what I experienced in that house has forever altered my perception of reality. I can only hope that by sharing my story, Any sceptics out there may, at the very least, widen their worldview through choice and hopefully not have it kicked apart against their will like mine was. Emma. Well, Emma, thank you so much for providing our season finale for season 14. And you pose a very interesting question. What happens to the spirit that haunts a home when the home no longer stands? It's certainly one to ponder on between now and season 15. And to give you that all-important date again, Friday the 29th of March is the date we return for our debut episode of season 15. Of course, our Patreons will receive that earlier and they will of course still receive weekly episodes of Dark Bites. As ever, don't forget if you'd like to join our Patreon team, head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. In the meantime, I'd like to sincerely thank each and every last one of you for choosing to spend your time with me right here on your show, The Dark Paranormal. And until we next speak on March the 29th for the start of Season 15, remember, when you're discussing the paranormal, always try and leave some of your disbelief at the door. And I'll speak to you Friday the 29th of March for the beginning of Season 15. Until then, take care.